this will be the fourth installment of the series to try the spirits this is volume four so first john chapter four verse one through four states beloved believe not every spirit but try the spirits whether they are of god because many false prophets are gone out into the world hereby know ye the spirit of god every spirit that confesses that jesus christ is come in the flesh is of god and every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist whereof ye have heard that it should come. And even now, already it is in the world, ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them. Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. So, today we are going to try the spirit of Easter. Don't be afraid, right? Uh, many people believe that Easter happens to be a pagan holiday for the fertility goddess Ishtar, or Astarte. However, I will make this statement before I go any further. Do not let the pagans dictate what we believe about the scriptures. They will always have a counterfeit and will pervert the truth of the scriptures. The truth will always be mingled with lies, right? And it will be irresponsible on our part to throw the whole baby out with the bathwater. Because uh, remember, in Second Timothy chapter two, verse fifteen, it, we are commanded to study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly divided the word of truth. So again, the question we are going to answer today is: Is Easter the way of the heathens? And I know whenever we do the Try the Spirits uh, series, usually we're proving that it is the way of the heathens. This time, this time, it's the opposite, right? So we're going to answer the questions: Is Easter the way of the heathens? Does Easter have pagan origins? Um, and spoiler alert, the answer is no. Um, but despite what you will hear and what people say about Easter, about being uh, being for the fertility goddess Ishtar, Ishtar Day, it is still a no. There are so many people that will say things that may strike fear in Christians. And this is why we study. You go out to this world, whether we're witness or when y'all get jobs and start working in this secular world, you're going to meet people that will say these things. And too often you'll see Christians or self-proclaimed Christians tremble in fear and uh, shut off and put their guards up and not study to prove what is the truth and what are the lies. So however, when we study the etymology of the word and just the history of Easter, we will begin to see the truth and see if Easter is the spirit of God or the spirit of Antichrist. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for another day. Thank you for bringing us here together on this Resurrection Sunday. Thank you for rising and fulfilling the law. Lord, we love you. In Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. So now when we look throughout the King James Bible, I have a question to ask y'all. Is the term Easter in the Bible? How many times? You sure? Yes, one time. Right. Um, it is, and sadly many people, believe, many people actually believe that this translation is a mistranslation in the King James Bible. Right. Um, Easter in the King James Bible, which is, do y'all believe it's perfect and preserved? All right, good. Um, it's not a mistranslation. When we read Acts chapter 12, verse 4, you can turn there. Um, Acts chapter 12, verse 4 states this, And when, we, when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to the four quatrains of uh, soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. So, again, like I said, you may meet or hear people uh, that will state that this is a mistranslation of the Bible or that the term is referring to a pagan festival or it should be have or it should have been translated as Passover instead of Easter. Um, however, the translators knew what they were translating and Easter is the right words. And again, we'll get to proving that. Um, and we will also notice that there was a message that the, the gospel writers, uh, Luke, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John and all the apostles there, there was a message that they were trying to convey in Acts chapter 12, verse 4. However, to get to the truth, let us knock down some myths that causes people to err from the biblical truth. Myth number one, Easter is a pagan holiday celebrated by King Herod. So, firstly, there is not any evidence to support this claim. Herod was the king of Israel at the time, and he knew that the laws and, un and understood the customs of the Jews very well. It is therefore highly unlikely, and with no evidence whether it is in the Bible or outside the word of God, that Herod celebrated Easter, a pagan, uh, a pagan festival called Easter. Um, when we read Acts chapter 12, verse 4, uh, you, can't, and come, you, you can't come to the conclusion that, oh, yeah, th this was a pagan festival that Herod celebrated, 
right, without reading into the text or adding to the scriptures um, that Herod celebrated Easter. You can't do that. Um, now, in the original 1611 King James Bible, they do give us a chart to find the date of Easter. And I forgot to print out the charts. Um, I, I actually have it. I was going to give it to you. all But um, so to assume that these King James Bible translators had no idea what they were doing or what they were translating is funny beyond belief um, because the King James, King James uh, versions translators viewed Easter as a Christian holiday. So why would they want us to know when a pagan festival was? That just seemed rather silly, odd, uh, confusing. Um, they will want us to know when Christ, our Passover, was, when the resurrection of the Lord was at. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Christ, our Passover, right? Uh, in translations before the King James Version, right? Uh, this verse used to be translated, translated as the Easter lamb. That's what they use, right? The Easter lamb. It wasn't until William Tyndall's uh, invention of the word Passover. Um, hence the reason why it was uh, because there was not a word for the Greek word for Passover um, in English for it at that time. Hence he took the word pass and over and put it together. Simple. Um, but First Corinthians chapter 5 verse 7, the Tyndall 1534, right? 1534, before the King James Bible, it states this, and uh, forgive me for my old English, Push therefore the old leaven, that ye may be new, though as ye are sweet breed. For Christ, or Esther Lamb, right, that's what they said, Esther Lamb, is offered vi for vis. Oh, it's ugly. All right. Cloverdale 1535, right? Another translation. They use, porch out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be new dough, like as ye are sweet bread, for we also haul an Esther lamb. Oh, wow. Before the King James Bible, they used Easter lamb. Um, Matthew's Bible, I'm not, I'm not going to say that again, right? Matthew's Bible, 1549, they used Easter lamb. I'm not, you read it, you'll be like, oh my gosh, like, what's this? So Tyndale also translated several New Testament passages as the Easter lamb instead of the Passover lamb. Um, clearly, he was not referring to some mythical pagan goddess called Ishtar, right? Or Esther. And people will actually do some research on the Ishtar or Esther thing um, and not just believe what men on the internet or Alexander Hislop, who will go into uh, later, um, have said, there is a lot of doubt that such things have even existed or was practiced. Um, I think these earlier English Bibles were looking at the Easter lamb in the post-resurrection Christian sense as a fulfillment of the Old Testament type um, that was the Passover. And that is why they translated it this way. The King James Bible perfected this revelation and placed Easter in the only post-resurrection reference in the New Testament. Myth number two. Easter comes from the name of the Semitic goddess Ishtar or Astarte, right? Usually if one believes in this myth, um, they tend to easily uh, believe in this. this. This is where they go to, right? That Easter and Ishtar, they're the same. They're the same. See, you see how they sound? I mean, they do sound similar, right? But we'll get into that. Frankly, many people who are against Christians celebrating Easter will use this myth right here. The false connection of the pagan holiday and the Christian holiday is traced from the Scottish minister, Alexander Hislop. Um, Alexander Hislop was an outspoken minister against the Catholic Church in Rome. And for the most part, he, I, uh, he was a very good historian um, because he told, uh, exposed the, the practices of the Catholic Churches and showed the root, the pagan roots of their practices and traditions. Um, however, and you can read that book called The Two Babylons. I do have the book um, in case y'all are ever interested. Um, but however, he was not correct about everything um, that he stated in the book. Um, at times, Hislop was very Hisloppy, right? Um, so he erred when it came to the Easter connection with Ishtar and Astarte. Uh, the basis he had for those claims were none. He just stated it, right? It was like a black Hebrew just saying, hey, brother, Easter, Ishtar, they're the same. They, I promise you they're the same. That, that's pretty much all he said, right? Um, 
so he had no basis. It sounded good, and it sounds like the word and star and Easter are connected, but they are not. Hislop did not uh, did have this bad habit of assuming without researching. He did not go back and give the etymology for these words at all. He just assumed, like everyone you'll meet that hold to this myth, it is sloppy and it, and it is dishonest to make this assumption without the facts. Though Ishtar Astarde um, may sound as if it's related to Easter, it is not. Ishtar in the original Hebrew is derived from the word astera, which means increase or flops. Astera is translated as flops four times in the King James Bible, hence why it is related to the animal fertility. And she was regarded as the goddess of fertility, hence why, you know, the Easter bunny has nothing to do with Christian Easter, right? Um, the eggs and all that stuff, that's fertility. We, we, I, I hope you uh, understand that uh, we, don't, we don't symbolize the bunny. Nowhere in the Bible do you find bunnies anyway. We symbolize the Easter lamb, if anything. Um, now let's go to the etymology again of Easter. Now the etymology of Easter, on the other hand, has nothing to do with flocks or animal fertility. Easter, or in German, Ostern, is a German wor Germanic word derived from the word east. Which direction does the sun rise? East, east right? Keep that in mind. So today, east refers to the direction from which the sun rises. The direction of east goes by the name uh, because the Saxon word east meant dawn or sunrise or morning. The etymology of east is as follows. Old English east, east, easterly, eastward from Proto-Germanic osto or astra, east, which means east towards the sunrise. Um, Old Frisian, Ost, East, um, Oster, which means eastward, uh, the Dutch, the Dutch, Oost, Old Saxon, Ost, Old High German, Ostan, German, Ost, Old Norse, Oster, from the east, from Pi, uh, Ost, to shine, especially dawn. Sanskrit, Ushas, uh, dawn, the Greek, Orion, morning, Old Irish, Usa, Lithuanian, uh, Azra, meant dawn, Latin, Aurora, right? meant dawn, oster, south, uh, excuse me, east, uh, literally, to shine. That's what it means. That's the etymology. From German, from English to German to Anglo-Saxon to High North Irish, blah, 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 blah. The east is the direction in which the dawn breaks. And the beauty of these translations is, is because of who Christ is. Again, I asked y'all the question earlier, which direction does the sun rise? East. In Christ, it's the S-U-N, Son of Righteousness, Malachi chapter 4, verse 2. But unto you that fear my name, shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings, and ye shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. Now, going back to in the old Germanic language, there's little to nothing about a pagan goddess. Now, it has something to do with the creation, like east or dawn, the creation, right, the elements, um, and yes, the pagans did celebrate, uh, worship the elements, but again, this has nothing to do that the original word for Easter or Ost or East means dawn, sunrise, right? Um, we can't take a word and say that's pagan, right? Can't do that. Um, look at the truth of the word. Easter has absolutely nothing to do with the word Ishtar or Astarte. Relating this Germanic word to the Semitic word is deceiving and it's like relating the word baby to Babylon, right? B baby in Babylon. B-A-B-Y-L-O-N. It's related, brother. It's related, man. Stay woke. Um, so the languages don't work like that, right? Um, they're not talking about the same things. The King James Version's translators were linguistics. And it's funny how people who are not... Um, who are not linguistics or don't even have an understanding of languages at all. And maybe I'm just being, you know, one-minded, uh, you know, because I know how to speak three other, la three other languages. But it's, not, it's still not that hard to understand, right? You, if you don't understand languages, why are we listening to the people that are making these academic claims that these words are related? 
the King James Version studied languages diligently and were very careful. It would be very, just rather odd that they d diligently translated the King James Version perfectly out of everything but this one part. In Acts chapter 12, verse 4, they missed it. It just seems kind of weird, odd. So, now with this knowledge of Easter, dawn, or sunrise, this made me pose the question, when did Jesus resurrect from the dead? So John chapter 20, verse 1 says this, The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early when it was yet dark unto the sepulcher, and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulcher. Hmm. Early when it was yet dark. And that's dawn. Matthew chapter 28, verse 1 to 2, In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn towards the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back to the, back the stone from the door and sat upon it. All right. So dawn, two witnesses. Dawn. Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early in the morning, right before dawn or at the crack of dawn. And that's probably when Christ arose. So the biblical resurrection could also be called the dawn. Right. Because that's what Easter means. Easter means dawn, the sunrise, the sunrise, the dawn, right? And the reason why we can add that par excellence, you know what the par excellence is? A par excellence is making a certain word just the best of the word. So the flood, there's plenty of floods throughout the world, but you call the Noah flood the flood because that specific flood was the most important flood than any other flood in time, right? This dawn, this sunrise, I mean, the sun rises and the sun goes down. We, we, we see it all the time. But this day when the sun rose was the special, the most special one, um, which is why it, it, I guess it would be appropriate to call it Easter, but also appropriate to call it the dawn. Um, so anyway, uh, they went from having a Passover lamb to witnessing Christ being the Passover lamb who take away the sins of the world. And those Jews who then grew up and became the first Christians understood that Christ was the Passover lamb and he resurrected at dawn on the first day of the week. They celebrated Easter, their Passover, while those Jews who didn't become, uh, became, uh, who didn't become followers of Christ continued with the old Passover. Right? So again, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened, for even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Here we see that Paul, in the early church, differentiates the old Passover with the new, our Passover. This, this is a different Passover, right? And the translators understood that, because, uh, uh, understood that because when they used the term Easter, it was in reference to the Christian Passover celebration. Now the date of Easter happened on the Sunday and concurs with the spring month of the Jewish calendar. Um, Christ's observance of Passover is as evidence for chrono uh, chronology of his life, Easter. Let us look at history and then we will go into what the Bible proves. On the Quattro uh, Domitian and other controversies dispute about Asiatic observance of Easter on Jewish Passover day, the 14th day of Nisan. N-I-S-A-N. -S uh, are y'all following me? I, I know this, this is going to be a lot of information, right? So, the Jewish Passover day was the 14th day of Nisan, which is the spring month, right? Polycarp, right? It was a man named Polycarp. Do you know who Polycarp is, right? Who's Polycarp? There you go. Yeah, right. <laughs> All right. Did y'all know that? No. I knew that. I just couldn't say off the top of my head. It was in here. Um, so Polycarp, um, where was I? Polycarp claimed, uh, wow, where am I? Oh, Polycarp, who was an apostle of John and uh, Antecedus, Disputed the questions, each maintaining his own tradition, claimed by Polycarp to be uh, Jonan. Uh, councils convened and decisions that feasts must be kept on Sundays only. Easter to be observed after vernal equinox. Uh, and so once only 
so once only in any year, hence to be further removed from the Jewish practice. So they do it once a year. That's all they say. They practice Easter, a different Passover than the Jewish Passover, once a year during the spring month, right? We're in spring. Sunday, they say only on Sundays, every year. Understand it? Cool. Now, let's go back to etymology. So the word, the Greek word that they use for Easter and Passover in the Bible, do y'all know what the word is? Pascha, right? Uh, P-A-S-K-A or P-A-S-C-H-A. So let us turn to the Greek that is used for the word Easter and Passover. The Greek word Pascha means Easter today. The etymology of Pascha or Paschal uh, is an adjective early 15th century meaning of or pertaining to Easter. It is from the old French Paschal, the 12th century, and directly from late Latin Pastels, from Pascha, Passover, Easter, from Greek Pascha, Passover, from the Aramic Pascha, which means Passover, which corresponded to Hebrew Pesa or Pasa, he passed over. That's what it means. Um, past was an early Middle English term for Easter. To add another layer to this, um, there is no doubt that Pascha means Easter in modern Greek. In the Gospel of John, there is already a distinction between uh, made, being made between the Christian Pascha and the Jewish Pascha. Uh, one of the words for Passover in modern Greek is Pascha, Passover the Jews. But we already we see the same phrase already in the time of John the Apostle, John chapter two verse thirteen, and the Jews Passover was at hand. John chapter 11, verse 55, and the Jews' Passover was nigh at hand. They use the same word. Right? The, the fact that John writes Jews' Pascha indicates that there was a need to qualify the word Pascha for the immediate audience of John's gospel. Such a phrase will be redundant unless there were already a distinction between a Jews' Pascha and another Pascha. Uh, apparently, within the first century, Christians had already appropriated the word Pascha to refer to the uh, Christian celebration of the resurrection. Pascha being translated as Passover, which is all over the King James Version Bible. Um, Acts chapter 12, verse 4 is the only place in the Bible where it is rendered differently. And it's rendered differently because it is what? Easter. That's what they use. Um, the translators looked at its context, passage, and the related history of that time. And that's how you... In different languages, English is one of the weird languages, but in different languages, there are many words that you, you may use the same word that mean, may mean multiple things. I know in Chinese, it's too many words that you say the same way, same pronunciation, and it means different things. So you had to figure out the context. You had to figure out the passage, what they're talking about. Oh, okay, that's what they mean. Okay, you use that. Okay, he's using that word for this meaning, right? I mean, even in the Hebrew. Um, oh, what's that word? The word for virgin. Can't remember, but the word for virgin is the same word for young woman. It's the same word for young maiden. But all you need to do is just look at the, the, the context, the proper context. So sometimes it's used for young woman, a young girl, little girl, or it is used for the virgin. The virgin shall be born in Isaiah chapter 60, I believe. I may be mistaken, forgive me. But let's go back to Acts chapter 12, verse 1 through 4. Um, Acts chapter 12, 1 through 4. Now about that time, Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church. And he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread. Keep that in mind. Verse 4. And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quatrains of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. So now when we look at Acts chapter 12, verse 3, we are told this was the time of the Jewish Passover uh, the, or the days of unleavened bread, right? When we look at Leviticus uh, chapter 23, verse 5 through 6, in the 14th day of the first month at even is the Lord's Passover. And on the, on the 15th day, of the same month is the feast of unleavened bread unto the Lord. Seven days ye must eat unleavened bread. 
right? Exodus chapter 12, verse 18. In the first month of the 14th day of the month at even, ye shall eat unleavened bread until the one and 20th day of the month at even, right? So, days of unleavened bread, right? Reference Leviticus chapter 23, verse 5 to 6, and Exodus chapter 12, verse 18. Peter was put in prison during a Passover date that is the usual Jewish Passover. Therefore, Acts chapter 12, verse 4, refers to not the, the Hebrew Passover. And after the Jewish Passover would be the uh, incorrect wording, meaning instead of Easter, they say the Jewish Passover. Um, that, but well, intending after the Jewish Passover to bring him forth to the people, right? Um, that would have been an incorrect translation. Therefore, again, Pascha in Acts chapter 12, verse 4, in its proper context, reveals that it is a non-Jewish Passover, Easter. Herod made peace, right? Some history. Herod made peace with the Jews by executing James during a Hebrew holiday. And during this time, the Hebrews did not object to doing such acts during their holidays. At this time, they didn't care. Usually, you know, it's a holy day. We can't do these things. At this time, they didn't care. Yeah, execute them. It pleased the Jews. Um, so if they didn't care about James execution during the days of unleavened bread, why would they care about Peter being executed? Right. Um, you had to ask yourself that. Um, why would Herod refrain from executing Peter during their holy day when they when we are shown that during this time, the Jews were perfectly OK with executing James during the holy days of unleavened bread? This would be a bad translation that Herod uh, waited to kill Peter after the Jewish Passover, right? There just doesn't add up, just really doesn't add up. Uh, the first Hebrew Christian church knew that this word Pascha for the Hebrew Passover was typolo uh, typological. Remember, when Christ resurrected, he fulfilled and replaced the old Passover and Christ became our Passover. Remember the Matthew chapter five, Christ said what? I did not come to destroy, but to what? Fulfill, he came to fulfill. We only do the old Passover, right? Um, so Christ became our Passover. They understood this. Therefore, they would observe a Pascha that was related to the Christ who resurrected from the dead. This Easter Passover is dated correctly and fits the days of unleavened bread's context because the only basis they had of the initial timing to this was the crucifixion and resurrection timing um, relative to the, that of the Passover. Um, the crucifixion occurred on a Passover preparation day just before Passover began that evening, requiring a three-day crucifixion resurrection observance starting the same day and evening of the seven-day Hebrew Passover. I hope y'all following me. Y'all good? All right. Don't worry. I'll, I'll give y'all the notes if, if it gets... Because I understand. Um, Herod... Uh, yeah... So, which keeps this closely linked. Herod could execute James and imprison Peter on the evening that begins the Jewish Passover day or on the following days, which were the days of unleavened bread. And he would wait to execute Peter until after the third day, which would be Easter, the resurrection day. And this would be logical and biblical and proven by Herod's political situation. Let's talk about Herod's political situation. All right. Y'all doing good. I'm proud of y'all. Right. Herod pleased the Jews by allowing them to keep their religion, by allowing them to practice their religion. But let us not forget that what happened in Acts chapter 2, verse 41, how many Christians were saved? Right. And after that, more. More kept getting saved. More kept getting saved. So 3,000 in one day. So you have 3,000 Christians in, a, uh, what do you call it, Jerusalem. But then more kept getting saved by the time we get to Acts 12, right? There's history at least states about maybe a, over 100,000 of Christians in Jerusalem at this time. Um, so, but just looking at Acts chapter 2, verse 41, we are told about 3,000 souls were saved by Christ. And even more after, I mean, if you can go back in time and just see that, wouldn't that be amazing, right? Um, but so the early church has some influence that has some political influence that will make Herod do whatever to please them too. Herod had to do a balancing act and you see it, what politicians do today. They want to please everybody. They'll go to a Buddhist temple. They'll go to a mosque. They'll go to a, 
oh, happy Easter or happy Ramadan. They'll, they'll, you know, balance, do a whole balance in that, trying to please everybody because they just want to get the votes. They want to stay in power. They don't want to riot to uh, ensue. Um, so, um, it, 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 so the early ch Christians had some influence that would make Herod do whatever to please them too. Herod had to do a balancing act. If Herod crucified Peter on Easter with all those Christians present, don't you think that will probably cause a riot or maybe some serious turmoil? It's going to cause some problems, some serious problems. I mean, that's like someone on Easter Day, knowing that Easter is special to the Christians, and they're saying, all right, we're going to, to persecute every pastor. You got disrespect, but then you got over here. You're making a statement now, right? A statement beyond statements. Um, also, history shows that Herod was not liked by the Roman military of Judea, even though Caesar appointed Herod um, to, to uh, that power. The military hated that he had this balancing act of trying to keep every Pharisee, Sadducee, and this new sect of Christians happy. The Roman military would probably have loved to see him make a bold statement against the early Christians by executing the famous and beloved Apostle Peter, which would most likely cause political and social unrest and turmoil. Hence, they will be able to use this for Caesar to replace Herod. Twice, hence, when it makes perfect sense that why it makes perfect sense that Herod did not plan to execute the famous Peter until after the Christian Passover which was, and still a sacred day, which is why Easter is the perfect translation for Pascha. Also, persecution of the Christians didn't, didn't, didn't happen immediately, right? Didn't happen immediately, um, at least from what history shows. From this time, about 20 years later, it happened. Um, and leaders of Rome would have gotten in trouble if they did such, uh, did such a thing during this time. Um, Pilate was removed from office for persecuting Christ, according to history. Right? Um, since Christ, Christ, Christ's resurrection superseded and fulfilled the old Passover, Pascha, after Acts chapter 1, only refers to the Christian Passover, with the exception of Hebrews chapter 11, verse 28, which refers to the Old Testament times. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, we already went over that too. Um, this verse shows that the Christian Passover trumps the Jewish Passover. The translators understood that the Jewish Passover was about the Hebrews' deliverance from Egypt and God's judgment of Egypt, which signifies the word, uh, uh, signifies the world, which is parallel to the crucifixion and resurrection, which delivered God's people from the world of sin and judgment of the world unto eternal death. Thus, they would see the first century Christians' Passover as three-day observance of the crucifixion and resurrection fulfilling the seven-day event, and this three-day Passover ending after the resurrection day or Easter, which is why Herod would have had to wait out Peter's execution. He's not going to do it. I want to please, I, I, I need to, I'm, I'm going to execute him to please the majority, but let's not do something at least on their special day. Only the King James Version um, uh, reinforces the 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7 teaching on Christian Passover, superseding the old one and indicating uh, and the indication that the King James Version alone is God's word in the English language. The King James Version precisely reflects the Greek text to us today because the use of Easter signifying the last day of Pascha. The new sense of Pascha in Acts chapter 12, verse 4 seems intended to mark superseding uh, the superseding of the Hebrew Passover by the Christian Passover, which even seems to emphasize by the new Passover ending the third day uh, that ignores the old con uh, continuance under the seventh day and in the process culminates the significance of old Passover events. Surrounding the use of Easter in the book of Acts seems intended to introduce the Christian Passover to scriptures. Like Herod's situation with the Jews and the Romans, so you can see that there's a superseding that took place with the Christians. They understood that the progression of Passover, they weren't observing the old lamb, but Christ, the lamb of God, which takes away the sins of the world. They understood that death and that resurrection of the Savior is the basis of the Christian Passover. Easter still appears exclusively in the King James Version, indicating God's ordination of this version alone at the present point in history when the Christian Passover effectively began to supersede the Hebrew Passover. Evidently, 
the King James Version's translators began the process of establishing the Easter rendering through its extensive use by the great moderator and translator William Tyndale. Right. So actually, let us observe what Sir Lesley Andrews. You know who that is, Lesley Andrews. Sir Lesley Andrews was one of the translators of the King James versions. So let's see what he had to say. And guess what? And he was a good man. Actually, read some of his sermons. It's pretty cool. Um, Lancelot Andrews was one of the KJV uh, translators, and he spoke before King James and preached about why we should keep Easter. So let us go over some of the excerpts of this uh, sermon. Sermon of the Resurrection preached upon Easter Day, 1618, Lancelot, 1618, April 5th, at Whitehall before King James. Amazing. Then will we descend to show the keeping of Easter to be such, ever in the use with the churches of God from the time of the apostles themselves, which if we can make plain, here is a plain text for it, that if one should ask what scriptures have you, why Easter may not be laid down, it may be well answered, uh, customs to keep it, we have the apostles, the church, had it, but to abolish it, such customs have been done. We depart from them both if we do, even by authority of divine scriptures it is that every year Easter is kept solemnly. We have touched two scriptures heretofore, the day which the Lord has made applied ever to this feast, that text for the Old and for the New Testament, that verse is in this epistle, Christ our Passover is offered, let us therefore keep a feast. So the King James translator, Sir Lancelot Andrews, is telling King James and the congregation, we keep this term Easter. It is right. Um, he says, Lantacetus, the most part of his life, lived under the persecution. He goes into history, right, before his time. Um, the most part of his life lived under the persecution, but died in the church's peace. So did uh, Pyrrhus of Alexandria for his excellence learning called Origen the Younger. And Lantis, Lant oh my gosh, seventh book, and 19th chapter, there is a plain testimony for the solemn keeping of Easter Eve. And uh, Perius say that St. Harriam had a long sermon upon the prophet Osi made by him and preached at the solemn assembly on Easter Eve. And if Eve were so held, we make no doubt of the day. Now, in the midst of the persecutions, there fell out a special case of Philip the emperor, supposed to have given his own and his son's name, to the Christian profession, as uh, Eusebius reported. Um, in sign thereof, he on Easter Eve offered to join himself at church service, at the church service, as knowing that to be their chiefest sol uh, solemnity, uh, which they failed not to keep, no, not then, when their case was at the hardest. And even then, at Alexandria, Dionysus, the bishop, uh, there held this custom. Thus writes he to Heriax, a bishop too, and to others out of prison, that though uh, the persecution uh, then raged much, and the plagues more, yet there yet were the Christians even then so careful to break not to break this custom as they kept their Easter. Some in the woods, some on shipboard, some in the barns and stables, yea, they in the very gown, keep it did even then persecution and plagues notwithstanding uh, Cyprian um, held this custom not by his homily I wave it as doubtfully doubtful but in four of his epistles I find it I named it I named but one his 53rd uh, some had consulted him in questions of some difficulty he writes back it is now Easter his brethren were from him everyone at his own charge Solemn, solemnizing the feast with their people so soon as the feast uh, was over and they met again they should hear from him he would take their opinions and return them a sound answer origin uh, had this custom in his eight uh, against uh, celsus frankly he confessed that other feasts easter by name the christian held them and that as he said some to uh, it's in latin then celsus which is translated, then Celsus, or any heathen men, of them all held theirs. Um, Tertullian had this custom, many places in him. 
only one eyesight in the 14th chapter, if it were the apostle's mind to raise out all devout observing of days quite, how come it to pass we celebrate Easter early at the circle of the year turning about? Irenaeus had this custom. His epistles to Victor showeth to Victor and to many more saith Eusebius about that question, understanding it's still the question of the time, not of the feast. Um, and as it's strange, and it is strange, even during the persecutions, how many books we find, it, uh, find written to deduce the customs by one besides that of Arrhenius, two, one of Anatolius, the great learned bishop of Laodicea, by Theopolis, bishop of Caesarea, um, and for by Baculus, bishop of Corinth, either of them one, another of Hippolytus that made the first cycle yet six, another by Clemens, uh, Alexandrinus, uh, and last, which indeed was first in all uh, two books, by the holy martyr and prophet uh, Melidio, uh, bishop of Sardis. In the next age to the apostles themselves set forth by them, as he saith, at the time of the feast and the very holy days of it. So, so far, before the King James Bible translators even lived, they're going to the time even after the apostles, the generation after the apostles, they're celebrating Easter. They're keeping this solemn feast. Now, they probably did it differently than how we do it. I, I, I don't know. I, I didn't deep dive into that research, which I, I, I plan on doing later, but for the sake of timing. Um, as it continues, enough, I trow, to show such a custom there was in all the churches these parties lived in which were all the churches of God then had. They must needs seem contentious who will contend against all these. Now to know, that is, to the apostles themselves, first, that it was a custom apostolic and so taken. Now, what be those things so generally observe? These that the passion, the resurrection, and the ascension of Christ, and the coming of the Holy uh, Spirit from heaven, um, are yearly in solemn manner celebrated. Um, if you will see it uh, deduced in story that may you too, thus of himself, Irenaeus writeth that he was brought up in Asia under Polycarp. We know who Polycarp is, the Apostle John, or a, a disciple, excuse me, a disciple of the Apostle uh, John, and that he, uh, young though he were, observed and remembered well of his course of life, and namely how coming to Rome in ancient, ancient time, he kept his Easter there. Polycarp then kept Easter. Now Polycarp had lived and conversed with the apostles, was made a bishop by them. That would be pretty cool, huh? Be made a bishop by the apostle. Bishop of Smyrna, Irenaeus, and Tertullian say it directly, and he is and he, and he is supposed to be the angel of the church of Smyrna, and Polycarp, as saith Irenaeus, kept Easter with St. John and with the rest of the apostles. Uh, Polycrates is in his uh, epistles there in Eusebius uh, expressly say that St. Philip the apostle kept it. If St. Philip and St. John by name, if the rest of the apostles had it, then nos, then it is ap apostolic. But yet we have a more sure ground than all these. The Lord's day has testimony in scriptures. I insist upon that. That Easter day must needs be as ancient as it is. For how, come, uh, for how came it to be the Lord's day? But that, as it's um, in the Psalms, the Lord made it. And why, uh, and why made he it? But because on it, the stone cast aside, that is Christ, was made the headstone of the corner. That is, because then the Lord rose because of his resurrection fell upon it. Origen, in his seventh upon Exodus, he said, Our Easter day far passed the Jewish Easter. They had no manna on theirs. Passover was eaten in Egypt. Manna came not till they were in the wilderness. But we say it, he, we never keep our Passover, uh, but we never keep our Passover, but we are sure of manna upon it, the true manna, the bread of life, that came down from heaven. For they had no Easter then without a communion. Notice, he's using the term Passover very interchangeably, right? If, if you were, if you kept up, right? Um, but Sir Lancelot Andrews, again, he is preaching in front of King James and telling 
telling them this, right? Um, he gives bits of credence of, one, his knowledge, but just of history, of the research that him and the other translators of this King James Bible did. Um, and again, and the reason why I'm telling y'all this and I'm going through all of this is because I don't want y'all to, none of my brothers, none of my sisters, I don't want y'all to say this one part in the King James Bible is a mistake. And we don't know how to study. I'm going to, I'm going to give you the information so you can study it. But if you believe that this is a mistake, well, guess what? A little leaven leavened it the whole lump. If you this part's a mistake, then you're going to find more quote unquote mistakes. But remember the four rules I gave you. What was rule number one? Hmm. Everything's from God. Right. Believe everything in this Bible because it's perfect, has everything, all the answers pertaining to life and godliness. But what was rule number four? If you find. Hmm. Right. If you, begin, if you begin to start reading into the text, if you start to see a contradiction, a mistake, refer back to rule number one. Believe everything that this word of God and this word of God is perfect, preserved, has all the answers pertaining to life and godliness. So the, the King James Bible, uh, he, he translated the word Easter because that's what they observed and that's what they used uh, it for. It was a pagan. Um, it should be obvious that the King James Bible translators themselves believe that the yearly celebration of Easter had both scriptural and apostolic authority. Again, they used Easter. They celebrated Easter. So how was this Acts chapter 12 verse 4 be, uh, oops, I forgot about this. No, it's not no mistake. All in all, Easter does not come from the Semitic word Ishtar. Excuse me. Easter derives from the old Germanic word meaning Eastern sunrise or dawn. Furthermore, there is no evidence at all that Herod celebrated a pagan holiday. The King James Version's translators made no mistakes with using the word Pascha and translated into Easter in Acts chapter 12 verse 4 because it indicates that the early Christians were already celebrating a Passover separate from the Jewish Passover. Furthermore, Pascha can mean more than the Jewish holy day of Passover. In fact, Greeks today who wish to send the greeting Happy Easter say Kali Pascha. That's what they say, Happy Kali Pascha. Literally, it means good Passover. However, it came, comes to mean good or Happy Easter. Uh, Christ, Christ's resurrection was a spiritual dawn because when he resurrected, that is when the light of salvation rose from the darkness of death. Isaiah chapter 60, verse 1 through 3. Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. And the Gentiles shall come to thy light, and kings to the brightness of thy rising. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 19. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well, that ye take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn. Oh, wow. Until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Revelation chapter 22, verse 16. I, Jesus, have sent mine angels to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. Christ is the morning star. Why? Because he arose from the dead in the morning, right? Christ is often compared to the rising of the sun in the Bible. Again, the sun rises in the east. And this is why Easter, from the Germanic word, that means Easter sunrise, day spring, dawn. It's fitting in a perfect translation. Do not be scared to use the word Easter. Don't be scared when someone comes up to you and say Easter is a mistranslation. Don't be scared. You got the truth now. You can take all my notes after this, right? Um, Easter is a Christian holiday. That has no connection to the fertility goddess. So, as we tried the spirits, we have proved that Easter is a spirit of God. Do I have any questions? Brother Alex, lead us out in prayer.